Hello and welcome back to another episode of Vikings Happy Hour, sponsored by Lake Monster Brewing and That's Badass Wood Art. Remember to head over to thatsbadasswoodart.com and use promo code CTPOCKET for 20% off any one item. And while you're here, please hit that like and subscribe button so you can come back and catch all this other Vikings content that we got coming the rest of this offseason, including today's video, which we're going to talk about Kevin O'Connell's presser. Uh, he's at the NFL annual league meeting and he sat down with some media folks today to kind of give, you know, some insights, field some questions just about the off season thus far. Um, and Ryan, I wanted to kind of just get your takeaways on, on what you thought about Kevin O'Connell today. Um, I know we talked a little bit pre-show what you like about him, but tell the fans what you like about Kevin O'Connell. Yeah, I mean, takeaways from the actual press conference themselves. I mean, there, there's a lot to take away from it, and we could, we'll probably dive into some of these key categories. But just in general, if you're talking from a general standpoint, the, just the level of specificity that he kind of goes into with media and with the fans in, in terms of just kind of his his approach to the game, his philosophy to the game. Obviously, he's not going to give away the all, all the trades and secrets that he has. Sure. But again, just like uh, trying to put things in layman's terms for the the average watcher and yeah. to help, kind of like what we were doing with Russ Brown yesterday in terms of some of the verbiage he uses and trying to educate people. Right? Yeah. Uh, he seems to do that well. I think he speaks very well to. Um, his vision and what mm-hmm. he wants for this team. One of the, one of the things I really took away from this outside of some of these core categories we'll likely get into is um, just his love for everyone within the organization, whether yeah. they're here or they're not here. Right. I mean, obviously he started the presser out with a, you know, a kudos and, and a tribute to Bud Grant. And then he went into Dalvin Tomlinson and how much he appreciated him, even though now he's gone uh, talked, you know, very glowingly about Pat Peterson um, and, and, and some, some of the other individuals who've left the team. Right. Uh, and just the respect he has. And then yeah. obviously talking greatly about all of the team, uh, the, the people we have in building too. It's just, it, he really seems to be creating a really good culture um, built around, you know, just trust, built around respect and, and built around uh, empathy, I think is probably a good word here. Yeah, he touched on a lot of different things, too, throughout this press conference, a wide range of topics. Um, obviously, you touched on the first one, very touching tribute to Bud Grant and just how, you know, his how that relationship sort of came to be when he was with or when he first started with the Vikings, Bud Grant was at his, his press conference and just sort of in a Bud Grant fashion was like, hey, you, we should, uh, we should get lunch soon. And then that just culminated into uh, a weekly visit for them, which Kevin O'Connell speaks very highly about um, and, and credits Bob Hagen for setting that up as well. Um, but one other thing that he kind of transitioned into right off the riff, which I thought was a, a pretty good question by someone is, is – Dalvin Tomlinson, um, because they pushed out that void year um, or void void date. uh, And a lot of people maybe thought that they were going to bring back Dalvin Tomlinson and it didn't work out. Um, And and Kevin O'Connell was, you know, he seemed to be, uh, you know, at a, he, he actually felt bad maybe that Dalvin Tomlinson wasn't going to be back said he's one of those guys that he'll always hold near and dear to his heart um, and he wishes him obviously nothing but the best but he, he says he always will think highly of Dalvin and, and spoke highly of him in that locker room anything you took out of that um, and if not what what did you take out of Kevin O'Connell's presser on a different topic yeah no I mean again just kind of going back to what I was saying a little bit earlier was just the fact that he truly is creating a really strong culture where yeah. respect is earned and but respect is given when earned. And I think Dalvin Thomason did a great job of earning that respect. Uh, he 100%. actually spoke to a couple of those points of like, you know, he, he showed in day in and day out, right. He was there giving it his best um, and, and really making a difference both on and off the field, uh, both, you know, obviously on the field, but also in the locker room, he spoke a little bit to that um, and just how much respect he garnered from everyone in the organization, not just him. So again, when you leave an organization, it's not always so 
you know, rainbows and sunshine like this. Right. And mm-hmm. for him to create that expectation that, Hey, we're going to respect you, whether we, you know, cause he had mentioned, we'd love to keep everyone and just continue yeah. to build and build and build and build. But unfortunately that's just not the nature of what we get to do in this, in this league. So, um, so again, kudos to him for, you know, showing that respect. Uh, I think Dalvin Thomason will hear this and respect that even, you know, that much more. So when, you know, where did he go? Alabama. So when a young Alabama guy that he's mentoring is like, hey, Minnesota, right? Like he's going to probably speak highly of the Minnesota Vikings and, and what we are able to do uh, with our time together. So it, it's all relevant. 100%. And kind of staying on the defensive side of things, we got to hear a little bit more about O'Connell's infatuation almost with Brian Flores. Um, and it's going to be a night and day difference from what we saw last year with, with Ed Donatel. But um, somebody asked him, you know, what, what was it about Brian Flores that, you know, really made you want to hire him? And he was just like the aggressive nature that on his background and on his tape, you really study his defenses and what it's like to play against that. And he's, he said that's what he's been intrigued about and why he wanted to bring him in. Um, I'm excited, man. I, I know we've talked about it at, at nauseum about the aggressive style we anticipate in this Vikings defense, but it's going to be way better than what we saw yeah. here. Yeah. I mean, and he was even talking, I think somebody had asked a question around like the league and like, I think it was something around like average depth of target was down the lowest since 20, 20, uh, 2006. Yep. And when, when you look at it from that perspective, you kind of gave a reason to why, right? Like what, what his philosophy is, is trying to keep everything from, you know, uh, somebody deep, right? Mm-hmm. And that leaves a lot of air in that intermediate part, which is what we as our offense likes to take advantage of with the Justin Jeffersons and KJ Osborne's and TJ Hawkinson's of the world. Yeah. Now, when we look at it from the perspective of, okay, now our defense is changing, I don't know. Like, I wonder if he still wants to keep that philosophy of, Hey, let's make sure nobody beats us deep, but with a more aggressive nature where maybe there is going to be that air there, but we maybe won't get that, that, that team enough time to get there, if that makes sense. So, because we're going to be blitzing and we're going to have an aggressive nature to uh, the way we attack that quarterback and making him uncomfortable uh, that, you know, hopefully we would be able to, mitigate some of those gains that were so frustrating last year in the middle of the field (laughs) well and hopefully some of the the people we draft uh will help and maybe there's people in free agency still that we can target um, because he did touch on byron murphy a little bit as well um and it's nothing new right like we've talked about it on this show plenty of times but what byron murphy brings is that inside outside flexibility um and I think that, you know, hearing him say that and how they're going to kind of utilize him in that aspect makes me feel comfortable about the signing even more. I mean, I was ecstatic with with the signing to begin with, but just to hear him vocalize, yeah, this is how we plan on using Byron Murphy. He's not just going to be a one trick pony. He's going to be our our versatile uh, cornerback to, to help out. And, and I like how he likened him to Jalen Ramsey with the Rams, right? Like how he'll move you all over the place. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. And again, and it, uh, it was encouraging to hear him talk about a Caleb Evans and yep. um, Andrew Boot Jr. Both in the building currently voluntarily um, getting better, getting healthier, doing what they can to do, uh, you know, doing what they can to get onto the field. Uh, here in the next year so it was encouraging to hear that and and all the work that they're putting in as well and then of course he had, he did mention you know we're still going to attack that position whether it's a draft or whether it's free agency we're still looking for ways to you know continue to add competition to that room but he did feel like it was going to be a competitive room going into training camp which he was excited about what did you think about the the wide receiver comments because somebody asked him about the wide receiver room just in general and for me personally I don't think it's a ringing endorsement for the whole group. Um, Obviously he spoke highly of KJ Osborne's, you know, intelligence and understands how he can play opposite Justin Jefferson. Uh, But for the rest of the crew, when you talk about Jalen Naylor and and Jalen Rieger, uh, he, he didn't give them like solidified 
roles in the offense. He just said opportunities to compete. And that stood out to me, which tells me that this team is probably targeting a wide receiver on day one. I mean, yeah, may- maybe not necessarily on day one, but yeah, I definitely think we're going to be targeting one and or two receivers between now and the draft, whether that's, or, and then maybe after the draft, obviously, but we'll see how the draft goes. Uh, but yeah, I-, I definitely think that there's still holes to be f- uh, filled there that mm-hmm. he is looking to re- replenish skill set wise into that scheme that he we don't currently have now obviously nailer i think does fit that kind of field stretcher ability but yeah. he's still pretty green and uh rager i don't know i, I don't know what to think of him i, I had high hopes when we <laughs> traded for him just because you know I, I didn't mind him i didn't mind his tape coming out i didn't think he was better than justin jefferson or brandon Ayuk or t higgins but i i thought he was you know, a, a fine receiver. So I wish he would be able to put up more than he is doing right now. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe things will turn around with a year, well, year one and a half into this offense or year two in this offense. Um, yeah. So I, to your point though, we're definitely going to be addressing that position at some point and pr- probably with multiple people, if he's saying that those guys are competition, but on the flip side, he did quickly transition to something that I think is a strength on this team, which is the tight ends. Yeah. Um, he, he, he did give a lot of kudos, obviously, to TJ, Josh Oliver, um, uh, Ellefson. Yeah. Uh, is Munt still in the team? Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah Munt um, and, and our – uh, muse he, he mentioned all of those guys and saying they're going to be able to provide us a lot of opportunity and again he, this goes back to some of the depth things at receiver where you know we can go three tight ends we can go five wide like he feels confident we can do you know any and all but mention how he said five wide but we really only have four receivers i mean i know we have some other receivers on roster but like I we only have four like receivers if you're TJ as a wide receiver too like that is his plan 100 percent Sure. So if, if you say five wide with TJ as one of those guys, I mean, sure. Do you really want to be trotting Naylor and Rager, uh, uh, and KJ and JJ as part of that five? You know, maybe you do. Again, Naylor did show spurts of quality play at the end of the year when he got an opportunity. But again, it's not like he was playing the elite you know, crop of defensive right. backs either. Right. So we'll see how much he improves. I mean, maybe he takes that KJ Osborne leap. Um, I love, I love how we refer to it as a KJ Osborne leap, by the way, where, you know, you have nothing year one basically. And then all of a sudden you're <laughs> relevant. Uh, but yeah, I mean, let's see if he can make that leap now. I hope he can. Um, but you, when you speak again about Kevin O'Connell's, just like talk about the offense in, in next year, we again got more validation that this team wants to run the ball. He, he talked about it today about marrying the run in the pass, being less predictable um, in that sense. And here we are. I mean, it's it's almost April. I know there were rumors around Dalvin Cook potentially leaving this team, but he's still here. So that tells me that they really are going to run forward with Alexander Madison and Dalvin Cook again um, and hopefully, you know, pound the rock in 2023 yeah i mean you definitely want to have that balance as he had mentioned in the press conference and you know whatever we need to do to get there i still don't know if (laughs) keeping both of those guys is the best interest of the team it could be a draft day trade right like yeah yeah i mean what but even if you do do that you're likely looking at potentially replacing him with a draft pick then right like a sure later round guy, whatever, but, you know, still want to, you know, replenish that. We still don't know what we have in Ty Chandler. Uh, Kenny Wangu hasn't really shown anything in, in, as a running back, great returner. Yeah. Um, and then obviously Alex Madison being the bell cow if Dalvin Cook's gone. So, um, yeah, definitely. And another quick thing about the press conference too, kind of in this realm of, you know, the analytics and, and trying to, I was going to bring this up. So I think you're heading where I was going to. Yeah. It was, well, it is just like his um, decision-making in game and his ability to, uh, you know, know when to go for fourth down or, you know, I I liked how he said that there's still kind of that gut feel because I really feel that way too. There's yeah, obviously analytics going to tell you one thing or another, but there's, the flow of the game and there's like, you know, all of these outside factors that analytics can't really uh, quantify like momentum and things like that, uh, yeah. that he still kind of takes into consideration in his decision-making, which again, I find great. And then 
an, another just culture building thing. He gives kudos to a, a, a guy he hired specifically to help him manage this in game in real time, which, yeah. and, and I forget the name, but that just kind of shows you like you're giving credit where credit's due. People remember that people uh, are, you know, will go to bat for you or run through a wall for you when they know that you are giving them the kudos and the attention and the love that they deserve. So just another, you know, high highly positive thing to think about Kevin o or that Kevin O'Connell does to create a better culture. Yeah. And the, and the question that was asked to get that answer, it, he kind of took it in an analytical way, but somebody asked him about Sean McDermott taking over play calling in Buffalo. Now that Leslie Frazier is, is, you know, taking a year off. And um, he talked about how th that guy who the name is escaping me as well, but the guy who helps him in the booth, um, really helps him become an efficient play caller because he's in his headset telling him all of these different decisions he could make based on analytics and whatnot. But then again, the gut feel that goes into there. Um, the last big thing from this presser, at least for me personally, um, and I feel like we can kind of read between the lines here, but you know, some people aren't ready to say goodbye to Kirk Cousins, but he was asked about quarterback contracts and said that teams are either – satisfied with the guy they have because they're a franchise changing quarterback or they're excited to look for the next one um, did not say which bucket the Vikings were in but then went on to talk about the quarterback contract and said it's a clear benefit of drafting one having those four years of that player on that scale that allows you to build the roster around those players it's been an advantage since the rules changed I mean <laughs> I mean, we, we've been preaching this on this show, uh, you, me, Miles, Jason, uh, Flip, you know, everyone's kind of been saying this over the last couple of years that, you know, unless you have that, that guy, which again, he's saying, he was saying in the press conference, like, if you have that guy, you're paying him and you're okay doing that because he's that guy. Unless yeah. you have that guy, um, you know, it's hard. It, basically, it's hard to win in this league because of the, the, the cap constraints that you get and, and not being able to build around your team. Again, he didn't say this verbatim, but he's kind of giving this as an overarching theme here. And um, with us being kind of in with his answers kind of being non-committal towards anything outside of 2023 on Kirk Cousins, you can kind of read the tea leaves that he's interested in trying to find that next guy. Um, granted, you know, maybe it doesn't work out. Maybe we don't have a trade partner. Maybe somebody doesn't fall to us. Maybe, uh, you know, we play well enough next year where we're not in position for the next guy. You know, again, Kirk Cousins is a good quarterback. Nobody on this show will say otherwise. He's a high, you know, I would say even like above average, you know, high quality quarterback. But in order for us to get to that next step, you need to find one of those guys. Again, yep. it doesn't have to be Patrick Mahomes. doesn't have to be the unicorn Josh Allen. But you have to find somebody who can play at a very high level early on in their rookie contract to allow us to compete while, um, while we uh, build that roster around them. Absolutely. Yep, I'm on the same page with you. And I, I feel like – a month from now, which we're officially, by the way, a month from the NFL draft, a little less now, um, I feel like we could be talking about a new quarterback in town. I, I'm just trying to read the tea leaves here, and I, I, I feel like it's headed in that direction, but I guess we'll, we'll wait and, and see when, when the NFL draft finally gets here. Well, and it's kind of interesting. I've been listening to podcasts all over the the podcast sphere and uh, talking about the different levelings of these quarterbacks and stuff. The only thing that I can find consistently is that Stroud and Young won't be available to us. Yeah. But outside of that, I mean, some people say, you know, Levis is the guy. Somebody uh, like early on. Some people say Richardson. Some people saying Hooker can make it uh, their way up into the top ten. I, I don't know. That's yeah, crazy to me, but, that one, but you know, you know, but people are saying it. Um, the likelihood, I think I, I heard the statistic today that um, the only time there's been four quarterbacks taken in the top 11 picks was 2021. It's never been done, or at least in you know recent history um, within, within the top 10, which likely means that there's somebody that's going to be slipping. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that top 10. Now, how far do they slip? How far are we willing to let them go before we move up? 
or are we content just waiting and hoping that it's, uh, I think the, the verbiage I heard today was a Jordan Love situation where he was the fourth quarterback. He was, you know, considered pretty good, but he had a free fall because, you know, a, you lot, a lot of people are content. Game. There's always uh, one, right? There's always one that falls. It yep. d- depends how far they fall, but there's always yep. one typically. Um, and so maybe the Vikings can capitalize. Let's hope so. I mean, Lamar Jackson, that was him in 2018. And we decided to trade for Kirk Cousins or, you know, sign Kirk Cousins, not trade, sign Kirk Cousins to the what big a contract. Crazy, crazy alternative universe that is. Uh, and now Lamar we're talking Jackson. about maybe trading for him. So it's just, it's, <laughs> it's all just kind of chaos, but it makes for a fun off season. Uh, I think we have a lot more great content coming up here. Um, I'm sure you're going to give the listeners a, a preview of what that's going to look like here. Yeah, so tomorrow night we have Chrissy Freud of Sports Illustrated, Matthew Collar from Purple Insider later in the week, uh, as well as just additional coverage for anything that comes up. And uh, if you're here watching this, remember, like, subscribe. We are doing a giveaway once we hit 3,000 subscribers. So tell your friends, tell your family members, tell your coworkers uh, to like and subscribe to our channel and be entered for a chance to win uh, that's badass what our skull sign. And I will get a picture eventually for one of these so we can show it on the screen for y'all. But uh, yeah, hit that like and subscribe button and come on back for the next time. Until next time, though, Skull Vikings.